Hey guys, it's Leon, and in this video, let's talk about the exposure triangle. This video is pretty much everything that you will ever need to know about the exposure triangle. If you didn't know, the exposure triangle is pretty much the cornerstone of photography, filmmaking, and pretty much everything related to imaging. And it is so fundamental, yet so advanced. And to this day, I am still learning new things about the exposure triangle. So let's get started. I think it's important to understand what the exposure triangle is. And as the name suggests, it's the three values that pretty much influence your exposure and many other things. It's the many other things that it also affects that makes it so freaking complicated, which is why this video is so long. If you haven't noticed, this is a very, very long video. And first, thank you for clicking in. And second, it's okay if you don't want to watch the entire video. You can find timestamps in the little play bar and in the description down below. So let's just get the basics out of the way. What is an exposure triangle, how it works, and basically how to use it from day to day in photography. The exposure triangle is made out of three values, the shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. Uh, I'm going to be covering the basics of the basics now because this video is going to get super, super deep the further we go. At the most fundamental level, how a camera works is that it's pretty much a black box with a little hole on one end, and as light passes through it in a given period of time, it is projected onto a sensor which captures those light in some way or another. So the three values that pretty much affect that is the aperture, which is the size of the little hole that the light is passing through, and then the shutter speed, which is the amount of time that the sensor is exposed to the light, and the ISO, which is the sensitivity to light of that sensor. Now, this is like pretty confusing when I put it this way, but just imagine it like this. I heard this analogy from somewhere on the internet. I forgot where I got this from, so I'm sorry to that person who came up with the analogy, but I find this to be very clear. So imagine a camera is like a bucket. Let's imagine it's a bucket under the rain, and you're trying to collect as much rain as possible. How would you do that? There are two strategies. First, you can leave this bucket under the rain for a longer period of time, or you can just get a very, very big bucket. You might decide to leave the bucket under the rain for shorter if the bucket is super big. And vice versa, if your bucket is super small, you might want to leave there for a longer period of time so that the bucket can accumulate more water. So with a combination of shutter speed and aperture, if you fail to capture a large amount of light, you can just crank the sensitivity up with ISO. This is pretty much the exposure triangle simplified uh, to its most fundamental basics. Now let's talk about how to actually use them uh, in terms of numbers. Shutter speed is a period of time that you leave the exposure open, right? So it is measured in time units, which is seconds. Usually we don't use seconds because a second is way too long. A typical shutter speed when you're just holding the camera, taking a picture, the shutter speed is so short that it can only be measured in a fraction of a second, one one hundredth of a second, one two hundredth of a second. So as the number gets larger, uh, because it's under a fraction, the shutter speed actually gets shorter. It's a fraction, basically. And similarly, aperture is also a fraction. So an aperture value of f1.8 is significantly larger than f16. Same thing applies. And ISO, I don't know specifically where this value comes from, but just know that ISO 100 is pretty much the base ISO and it only goes up from there. And as you go up, like ISO 6400 is a lot brighter. Now, if you recall me saying that the exposure triangle, it adjusts the exposure and many other things, this is when it gets complicated. Now, it might seem a little confusing that why are there so many ways to adjust exposure? Why aren't there just like an exposure slider, right? We actually want to use different combinations of the exposure triangle to get different kinds of effects because of the all the other things that these stuff affects. So let's recall what shutter speed is. Shutter speed is the amount of time that your camera is exposed to the light, right? So if, let's say, in that duration, your subject moves or your camera moves, you might get a camera shake or a motion blur. That's pretty much just telling you that when the shutter is open, let's say my hand is here, and when the shutter is closed, my hand moves all the way over here and it captures a streak of my hand as I go across it. And if you want to reduce the amount of blur, you crank up your shutter speed. You expose for a shorter amount of time, which will get you a cleaner result. 
In terms of shutter speed, there's actually this rule of thumb called the reciprocal rule. This originated all the way in the film days and it doesn't really apply in modern day photography, but we can still talk about it. If you forget about everything you learn about in high school algebra, like me, uh, the reciprocal of something is basically the one over of that thing. The reciprocal of 50 is one over 50. If you have a focal length of 50 millimeters in the film days, at least you will use a shutter speed of the reciprocal of 50, which is one over 50 if of a second. Now with modern cameras having so many different kind of formats and so many different kinds of feature sets, this gets complicated. So what if I'm actually shooting this on an APS-C camera? I actually need to get 50 and multiply that by the crop factor 1.5. However, modern cameras are a lot sharper than in the old days when everyone shot film. So depending on the megapixel count of your camera, you might need to go up two to three stops in order to compensate for that. What if your camera has image stabilization? For example, on this camera, I have an image stabilization of eight stops. So then you scroll back by eight stops. So as you can see, this gets complicated. So if you're confused about what shutter speed to use, don't just look up the reciprocal rule and just follow that strictly. You have to understand that there are things to bring the reciprocal rules to digital, but it's really complicated. So the rule of thumb is just take a photo, zoom in, see if it's blurry. If it is, fix it. If it's not, reduce it. And keep doing that until you find the desired shutter speed. And for aperture, Aperture also affects the background blur that you're getting with the asterisk. Talk about that later. For now, you just know that aperture affects the amount of background blur that you're getting, which means that the bigger the aperture, so the smaller the number, remember, is a fraction, right? So f1.8 in comparison to f16 will get you a blurrier background. And next, the last value, of course, is ISO. ISO is pretty much dealing with the signal of your sensor. By cranking up the signal, you also crank up the noise. This is pretty much true across the board for all electronics. There's signal and there's noise. If you have a low signal, you gotta have a high noise. So generally speaking, again, big asterisk, the lower your ISO, so ISO 100 will have less noise than ISO 6400. Now, for a lot of people, this might be enough to get you a long way in photography. But if you're like me, and if you're that type of person to take apart like your toys when you're young and forget how to put it back together, we can actually dive a lot deeper into the exposure triangle if you want to. So now let's talk about how the exposure triangle or shutter speed, aperture, and ISO works on a physics level. So previously, I just simplify shutter speed to the amount of time that the shutter stays open. But if you've ever looked at your shutter speed chart, it goes all the way down to like one four thousandths or even faster of a shutter speed. How is that possible, right? How is the shutter going to open and close for exactly one eight thousandths of a second? Well, they don't. Basically, a shutter has a front and a back curtain. There is a front curtain that opens up the shutter for exposure and a back curtain that closes the shutter. If you're exposing for, let's say, one second or two seconds, or even like 1 50th, 1 100th of a second, uh, the camera is actually fast enough to open up the shutter, expose, close the shutter. But if you go further, let's say if you go above 2 50th of a second, uh, let's say to 1 500th, how it controls the light is that when the front curtain opens, the back curtain immediately follows. And that gap that it creates, that's actually what's controlling your exposure. The exposure time is actually similar, but just by changing the gap in the front and back curtain, that actually affects your shutter speed. This actually has practical implications when you get into flash photography, which is later down the video. But at this point, just know that a shutter speed, it doesn't actually work the way you expect it to. Basically, it's the front curtain and the back curtain controlling the amount of gap. And the size of that gap is your shutter speed. Now let's talk about aperture. Perhaps I should put this in front of shutter speed because it's arguably more important. In the very, very ancient past of like when people are living in caves, it's actually possible that there are photography technically speaking, because when light passes through a very tiny hole, it can actually project an image onto the back. This is just like a physics property. So this is not unique to cameras. So if you're standing in a really dark cave and there's a small hole on the wall, you can actually see an image projected on one side of the wall of what's happening outside. This might be the very, very early stage of photography and it's all based on the pinhole camera. The ancients might have used this in like their cave paintings and later down the road, it is speculated that painters also used this property to nail their painting. Before the era of photography, we have actually used the principle of a pinhole camera in other arts before, which is pretty cool. 
And similarly to those like cave paintings, the camera that we're using today, the camera I'm filming this on, is pretty much the exact same thing. It's a little hole on one side of the black box that projects an image onto the wall where somehow the light is captured. Once you understand that the aperture is that little hole, we can actually start to apply physics to that. Now, I'm an art student and I don't know that much about physics, but I think as an art student, I feel like if I can understand something, most people should be able to. So this is my attempt on explaining optical physics to you guys. All right, first, let's just pretend that this is our camera. And to make this easier to understand, let's look at this camera on a front view. The outer circle here is the size of our lens, and the inner circle here is the size of our front element, or our first piece of glass. And within this first piece of glass, we will see our aperture. So the size of the aperture as seen on the front element is called the diameter of the entrance pupil. And as you might know from high school physics, all light rays need to be converged in order to be brought into focus. So the actual convergence actually happens inside the lens, but in order to simplify this, we'll draw it outside because it will be easier for us to understand. Now, an interesting fact here is that the distance between the convergence and the point where they actually converge, this distance is actually called the focal length. All right, now let's bring our focus to the front of the lens. Get it? Because focus. The point where the lines converge, this is called the plane of true focus. Because it's only at this two-dimensional plane that things are exactly in focus. And around the plane of true focus is actually our depth of field. The depth of field is the range around the plane of true focus. Things are only a little bit blurry that we just consider them as in focus. So this is our depth of field. And if you look at the two ends, you'll see that uh, things are a little far apart. The further apart the two lines are, the blurrier they become. So if we say that if we're photographing a person here, and in the background there's, let's say, a tree, uh, the tree will be blurry while the person will be in focus beca because the plane of true focus is on the person. To adjust the plane of true focus, we will just, you know, adjust our focus. What actually affects the amount of background blur that we're getting? What makes this tree blurrier? Well, what we're trying to do basically is we're trying to get these two lines further apart. There are basically only two ways of making these two lines further apart. The first strategy is we can increase the diameter of the entrance pupil. So if we increase the diameter of the entrance pupil, you'll see that these two lines, they go further apart and that will make a blurrier background. Or if the diameter of the entrance people is the same, we can move our plane of true focus forward, in which case the lines need to converge more abruptly in order to meet the plane of true focus. And that will basically make the lines further apart. So the two things that affect the amount of background blur is the diameter of the entrance people and the distance to the plane of true focus. And then there are factors that affect these two factors. Uh, so things like f-stop will increase or decrease the diameter of the entrance pupil. Or let's say the focal length. Increasing and decreasing your focal length because you're adjusting the angle of light that is letting in, your lens needs to compensate for that with a bigger or smaller diameter of the entrance pupil. Additionally, increasing or decreasing your focal length will affect the distance to the subject, which will affect the distance to the plane of true focus. And if you're not shooting on a full frame camera, so if you're shooting on APS-C camera, your crop factor will affect your focal length because if you're shooting on a micro four thirds camera, instead of shooting on a 50 millimeter, you will just be shooting on a 20 millimeter. Now let's look closer to this f-stop. Uh, you might notice that f-stops are written as like f2.8 or f1.4 and it might look like a fraction and that's because it's actually a fraction. So the formula for this is that the f number, so 2.8 or 1.4, equals to the focal length divided by the diameter of the entrance pupil. And you might also see this written as 1 to 2.8, and that's the same thing because a ratio is the same thing as a fraction. It's just written in different notations. The name ISO actually is International Organization of Standardization, which should be IOS. But why is it called ISO? That's because in different languages, the International Organization of Standardization is actually pronounced differently. So universally, the organization just said 
All right, we just gave up naming this. So everyone just call this ISO, which is why ISO is actually not an acronym. It doesn't stand for anything. So you really shouldn't pronounce ISO as ISO. It is one word, ISO. And the ISO that we're talking about, the International Organization of Standardization, Jesus, that's a mouthful. It's the same organization of the ISO container, also known as the shipping container. They pretty much just regulate how things work in the world and make sure that things are in its standard across the board, no matter which country you're in. ISO actually measures the light sensitivity per area. It's not per pixel, it's not per sensor, it's per area. So let's say if you have a small sensor, like a micro four thirds sensor, and if you compare that to a bigger one, let's say a full frame sensor, when both of these are at ISO 100, and if you crop out a one by one square centimeter of that sensor, the images are actually going to be identical in terms of their noise levels. But if you compare the overall image, the micro four thirds will be much noisier than the full frame. And also at this point, you pretty much just realize that ISO is just gain on pretty much every other type of signal processes. Like when I'm recording this audio and I need to adjust the gain, it's just called gain. And for some reason it's called ISO on a camera. Once we understand how things work, we can actually dive into the practical implications of these subjects. So first of all, shutter speed. When you open up a shutter for a really long time, usually past two minutes, here's what's gonna happen. Your sensor is going to be exposed to light for such a long time that heat is going to gather up in the sensor, which will increase noise. So when you open up a shutter for longer than two minutes, you need to be mindful that your sensor might get overheated. And on the other end, our front and back curtain of our shutter, if you're trying to sync with flash, this can actually get difficult because until a certain point, not the entire sensor will be exposed to light at the very same time. And when a flash is so short that it's actually comparatively shorter than the duration of a shutter, this becomes a real problem. So when you get past, usually one to 50th of a second, flash sync is going to be your issue. Let's keep going up. For some lights, it can actually start flickering at 1 50th of a shutter speed, but for some, it can actually go like really, really far into the thousands of a shutter speed. But lights also flicker at a certain value. When you turn on a light, it doesn't just turn on. That's not really how it works. It's actually flashing on and off so fast that our eyes actually can't detect that. But a camera, if it's photographing at a faster shutter speed, can. On cheaper LED light bulbs, so if you're photographing like indoor sports, this can be a real issue. Or if you're photographing events and in the back there is a giant LCD display, that might also be flashing at a certain flickering rate. And if you're not careful to select the shutter speed, that's exactly the period of one flash of the light, you can get flickering issues in your photographs. Which is why the Sony A9 actually has an adaptive shutter speed range that goes like really, really precise to dial in exactly the flickering rates of indoor sports lights. And lastly about shutter speed, uh, you need to be careful of rolling shutter. When your camera is reading what's on your sensor, it's scanning that from the top roll to the bottom roll, which means that there's actually a slight delay and that delay can actually be noticeable. For example, if you're panning from left and right very quickly, you can get what's called a rolling shutter, which is that when you are using this type of shutter, which is called a rolling shutter, by the way, um, you can get this jello effect where the top of the image is just a fraction of a frame in front of the bottom of the image, which is why in some cameras, they use a global shutter, which means the image is actually pumped out on the entire sensor all at once, instead of standing from top to bottom on a rolling shutter. Next, let's talk aperture. Opening up your aperture up actually shows the flaws of your lens more. This is into the optical physics realm that I don't really understand, but just know that in many lenses, when you open up the aperture, the image quality drops significantly. You got problems like vignetting, which, which is the dark shadows on the corner of your frame. You also get sharpness reduction, which is when the image gets softer. You also get chromatic aberration. Okay, this is like a pretty scary word, but it's not that scary. It's when a bright light shines through the lens and it diffracts a little bit into different wavelengths. And you see like purple corners or green corners on brighter lights or like in between the leaves. That's chromatic aberration. These are all problems at larger f-stops. As you stop down into smaller and smaller aperture values, these issues reduce. Up until a certain point where the aperture is so small that 
a physical property called diffraction starts to happen. This is when light passes through a very, very small hole and the image quality actually gets a little bit worse, usually in terms of like sharpness reduction. Meanwhile, when really bright light passes through a very small hole, you can actually get a starburst, which is very, very noticeable in a lot of landscape photos as a stylistic choice. Because of the degradation of image quality at the two very extreme ends, there's actually a sweet spot in between that where the image quality is at the most optimal. But this largely depends on your lens. And if you want to find the sweet spot of your lens, you should go on DxOMark and look up the specific lens that you have and look at the sharpness graph. That'll pretty much tell you. And by the way, from now on, there's going to be a lot of mentions of DxOMark, which is a benchmark website for lenses and cameras. No matter how you feel about DxOMark, at least they give me like real numbers to compare to. Up until this point, I've actually been telling you guys that aperture or the f-stop actually controls the amount of light that's passing through. That's not true. There's actually something called a t-stop, which is separate from the f-stop, but they work in similar ways. The f-stop only affects the diameter of the entrance pupil, which affects the depth of field, while the t-stop is actually measuring the transmission of light that's passing through the lens. The fact that t-stop and f-stop is separate might be confusing, but you have to understand that when light passes through anything, no matter how expensive that piece of glass is, it experiences some degradation to that light. Just because your aperture opens up for it that big doesn't mean that much light is passing through. On cinema cameras, because exposure really, really matters in between shots, the T-stop is very clearly labeled on the lens, while in photography cameras, it's usually the F-stop. I hope more cameras can get to T-stops, but until then, you can also look up the T-stop of your lens on DxO Mark. Usually, it's just a little bit smaller than your F-stop, but you have to understand the differences between them, and you have to know where to look that up. Lastly, ISO. ISO is the amplification of signal, right? It is a gain. If you're wondering, like, why does ISO matter? Why shouldn't I just be able to choose that in post? If that's just a choice of an amplification of signal, you would be absolutely right because you can actually change the ISO after you shoot. So first, we need to understand what a base ISO is. A base ISO is not the lowest value of the ISO. There can actually be many base ISOs. Some cameras only have one base ISO, which is usually at ISO 100. Let's say if you want an ISO 200 image, they'll just run it through the ISO 100 circuit and then just boost up the signal by two times. And there you go, an ISO 200 photograph. And if you want an ISO 6400, and you would just take the ISO 100 photograph and you amplify the signal by 64 times and you get an ISO 6400 photograph. That's true for most cameras, but for some camera, they actually have a dual gain sensor. By the way, it's actually called a dual gain, not a dual ISO sensor. I'm just gonna give you an example. A dual gain sensor, let's say if you have a base ISO at 100, you might also get another base ISO at ISO 6400. And what's gonna happen with that is if you're shooting on an ISO, for example, of 3200, you're actually taking that ISO 100 photograph and you're amplifying the signal by 32 times. And when you're shooting an ISO 6400 photograph, you're just actually taking a base ISO of ISO 6400. Without all those amplification, your ISO 6400 photograph is actually going to be less noisy than your ISO 3200 photograph. This is an advantage of dual gain sensors and it is why some cameras are so good at low lights. That's because they have a dual gain at a very, very high ISO, where if you look at this chart on DxO Mark, the noise level actually drops a little as it gets to the secondary base ISO, which is why previously when I said that your noise level will increase as you increase your ISO, that's technically false because when you have a dual gain sensor, it actually drops a little bit. To test this, you can actually start shooting uncompressed RAW on your camera and then just shoot a base 100 ISO for all of your shots. And if you just crank up the exposure in post, it'll actually be exactly the same as shooting it at a higher ISO value in camera. Recall when previously I said that your aperture or your f-stop it's actually not the same as your t-stop. Just because you're shooting at f2.8 doesn't mean you're shooting at t2.8. That's also the case for ISO in a slightly different way. ISO 100 doesn't mean you're shooting at ISO 100, even though it's clearly labeled as ISO 100. That's because when reviewers are reviewing for cameras, they always dial the camera to ISO 100 and then compare the noise levels in between the cameras. So imagine if you're manufacturing a camera and you decide that, okay, I'm gonna say it's ISO 100, where in reality is ISO 50. And they start doing side-by-side -side tests of ISO 100 photographs, they'll be like, oh shit, this one for some reason is less noisy, even though all of them are at ISO 100. One camera manufacturer start to do this, all the other ones will start to follow. So in reality, ISO 100 in most cameras 
are actually somewhere in ISO 80, ISO 70, ISO 60, somewhere in that range, which is why ISO is pretty much fake. That value only applies on your camera. If you put that exposure value on another camera, they'll get a completely different exposure, which I find personally to be very ironic because remember what ISO originated to be, International Organization of Standardization. That doesn't feel standardized to me. All right, moving on, ISO. Uh, how do you get an ISO 1 image? Most cameras can shoot base ISO, ISO 100. What if you need to get lower? You can actually get lower, but not in camera. Remember that ISO is just gain, right? So if you take two identical images at ISO 100, and if you average out the pixels, you will actually get an ISO 50 image because that averaging will reduce the noise by two times. Now, if you keep doing this, let's say if you take 100 identical photos at base ISO of 100 and average them out, you will actually get an ISO of one. That's insane, which is why your ISO really doesn't matter if you're photographing star trails. Now let's extend this further. Can you get an image with ISO zero? No, you can't. You cannot get an image with ISO zero. No matter how much image you average, you cannot get an ISO of zero. Imagine multiplying anything by zero that'll get you zero. If you amplify anything by ISO of zero, you will get complete darkness. So it's actually impossible to get an ISO of zero. Now we have arrived at flash photography. When I first got into flash photography, I was completely overwhelmed by the exposure triangle. So let's first rewind and review the physics of the exposure triangle. Shutter speed has two curtains, front and back. When your shutter speed goes above, let's say, 2 50th of a second, the gap in between the front and back curtain is your shutter speed. The entire shutter won't be exposed to light at the very same time. F-stop, however, changes the opening of the lens. So the bigger the F-stop, the larger the lens is opening up. ISO is nothing flashy like F-stop and shutter speed. It's just the amplification of signals. This is when it gets confusing. Flash doesn't flash the entire duration of your shutter speed. The amount of duration that a flash flashes. Holy shit, English is stupid. Okay, the amount of time the flash flashes is so short comparing to a shutter speed that it's almost like an instance. How do we apply this to the exposure triangle? What happens when during our exposure, something really, really bright flashes for a very short amount of time? What happens, first let's look at what happens to shutter speed. If it flashes for a really short amount of time, no matter how long or how short the shutter speed, opening up your shutter for longer won't let more flash in. It'll only let in the ambient light. So as you increase and decrease your shutter speed, you might notice that your flash doesn't get brighter or it gets darker. It stays just about there. The ambient light or the light that's just always on, those lights get darker and brighter. So shutter speed affects the amount of ambient light that is letting through. The f-stop, however, when the aperture gets smaller, less flash can pass through. And when the aperture gets larger, more flashlight can pass through. So f-stop now actually affects the overall exposure of your image. Same is true for ISO. ISO is just cranking up and down the gain, right? So ISO also affects the overall brightness of the image. Just know that when you're dealing with flash, shutter speed only deals with the exposure of ambient light. It doesn't deal with the exposure of the flashlight. I'm not gonna get too deep into flash because that's a whole other rabbit hole, but just know that when you go above 250th of a second of a shutter speed, or when you go above the flash sync speed, your flash actually needs to fire multiple times throughout the duration of a shutter opening in order to expose the entire image to flash. Now, this is pretty much all you need to know in terms of the exposure triangle. Uh, it's pretty apparent that you probably like photography, and if you do, you can check out some of our other photography content on this channel, and if you like them, consider subscribing. And if there are any mistakes that I made in this video, which I am sure there are, comment down below. Let's fact check this video. And again, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.